Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Welcome to Easter 2021. Now this Easter is a lot different than Easter 2020, isn't it? That Easter, we were all in the midst of a lockdown, unsure how long it would last and exactly what life was going to look like in the future. And while the pandemic is still going on and we still need to be careful, there is a light in sight. There is hope. In fact, at all four of our Trinity campuses this Easter morning, people are gathering in person for worship. And for those of us who are unable to do that this year, we have this chance to be together online. I pray that God will bless your Easter worship today. In fact, let's do that right now. Would you bow your heads and would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for the gift of new life. We thank you for the gift of spring. We thank you for the gift of hope, all of which is ours through Christ Jesus our Lord. Bless our worship as we gather to celebrate his victory over sin and death for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now we begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Listen to this reading from John chapters 19 and 20. Afterward, Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus, asked Pilate for permission to take down Jesus' body from the cross. When Pilate gave permission, Joseph came and took the body away. With him came Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night. He brought 75 pounds of perfumed ointment made from myrrh and aloes. Following Jewish burial customs, they wrapped Jesus' body with spices in long sheets of linen cloth. The place of crucifixion was near a garden where there was a new tomb never used before. And so because it was the day of preparation for the Jewish Passover, and since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Then early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived, and he went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth had been covered, Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that Jesus must rise from the dead.
Would you bow your heads and pray together with me? Lord God, we come before you on this Easter Sunday willing to admit that we are not perfect. In fact, we often sin and do what is wrong in your sight. Today, we know that you have made amazing promises to us that all things work together for good for those that love you and that you will be with us always and that perfect love casts out fear. And yet also today, Lord, we confess to you that we often do not trust in those promises. We rely on ourselves instead of relying on you. Lord, forgive us for our lack of faith, for our lack of trust, for our lack of hope. And hear us now also this Easter as we take a few moments of silent confession before you. Hear these prayers as they rise before you, Lord. Amen. God's word says, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hear these words on this Easter. Your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The text for our Easter worship and meditation today is found in the last chapter of Matthew's gospel, chapter 28, beginning at the 18th verse. Following Jesus' resurrection, Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching these new disciples to obey all the commandments that I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is our Easter gospel. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Please pray with me. Dear God, thank you that you make all things new. Thank you for the victory and power in your name. Thank you that you hold the keys over death, that by your might, Jesus was raised from the grave, paving the way for us to have new life with you. Thank you that you had a plan, that you made a way and that we can share in your resurrection. We confess our need for you, fresh, new, again. We ask that you renew our hearts, minds, and lives for the days ahead. We pray for your refreshing over us. Thanks be to you, God, for your indescribable gift. To you be glory and honor on this resurrection day and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. shines for all to see. 
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Now it may seem strange celebrating Easter from home, but I want to encourage you to do it with all your heart. In fact, let's try that one more time. I invite you to respond together with me. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Would you bow your heads and would you pray with me? Lord God, I pray as we gather together this Easter Sunday, even though we are apart from one another in our homes, knowing that your promises where two or three are gathered, and it doesn't specify how we're gathered. Today we're gathered online. Where two or three are gathered, there are you among them. Lord, we invite your presence into our worship this Easter Sunday as we celebrate together. Amen. So this is a picture of my grandfather and me, actually, when I was much younger. 
Now, my grandpa was one of my favorite people in the whole world growing up, except for one Easter Sunday. You see, this is what our Easter tradition looked like when I was a little kid. Uh, our family would get up and have breakfast and go to church together, and Grandma and Grandpa would meet us at church. And then when we came home from Easter Sunday church, the kids had to wait in the car while the adults went in the house, and they hid our Easter eggs in our Easter baskets. And I remember one particular year that uh, that we came running into the house when we were told we could, and we started looking, and I started finding Easter eggs right away, but, but you see, what you wanted to do is you wanted to find your Easter basket fairly quickly, because then you had a place to put the Easter eggs that you were finding. And there were some ground rules in our house. One of those ground rules was uh, that I couldn't hog all the eggs. I had to make sure my sister got a fair share of the eggs as we were looking together. She's younger than me, and so, uh, especially when I was younger, she was pretty young, and you know, I had to make sure that Carolyn got a fair share of the eggs. But one of the other ground rules was that uh, you couldn't go looking in places like the attic or the laundry room or you know places like that. They, they were off, off limits. It was our bedrooms, it was the living room, and it was the kitchen. Those are the only places that stuff could be hidden that you could look. Well, this particular Easter, I was looking everywhere for my Easter basket and I, and I just couldn't find it, and I, and I started getting a little upset, and I started saying to my mom and my dad, we're, I, I can't find my Easter basket, and they were like, go talk to your grandpa, he's the one that hid it. And, and, and so I went to grandpa, I'm like, grandpa, I can't find my Easter basket, and he just got this twinkle in his eye, and I, I knew something was up, and I said, grandpa, did, did you break the rules? Did, did you hide it somewhere? that I'm not supposed to go, and, and, uh, and he said no. And I said, are you sure? And he said, I promise, I promise you, I didn't. Well, he did. <laughs> Finally, about an hour later, when I was practically in tears, he admitted that I should go look in the laundry room, and sure enough, there it was, inside the dryer. I was not very happy with my grandpa that day. Now, the fact is, we hear those words a lot in life, don't we? I promise. We hear them from politicians, and by now we know that campaign promises aren't normally worth the paper they're printed on. We hear it from, from companies or, or from salesmen. They, they make certain promises about their products, and sometimes those promises just don't hold up. Unfortunately, sometimes we hear those words from people we love and care about in situations a lot more serious than where your Easter basket is hidden. And and often I think those we love mean those words when they say them, but life gets in the way. Or maybe they never really did mean them and promises get broken. Now, this Easter Sunday, we are beginning a new series, a four-week series called The Four Witnesses. We're going to be looking together at the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and what they have to say about Jesus. We're going to be looking at how each one of these gospel writers is writing with maybe a little different purpose to reveal something a little different about the person of Jesus, is writing with a little different perspective. I like to think of it this way. It's, it's like Jesus is a diamond, and, and each one of the gospel accounts is a different facet in that diamond. As, as you look through those different facets, it's still the same diamond. It's still the same Jesus, but you get a unique and beautiful picture of Jesus, depending which facet, which gospel you look at him through. And this week, this Easter Sunday, um, we're going to encourage you to not only study these gospels together on the weekends with us, but we want to encourage you to, over these next four weeks, to read through those gospels as well. And by the way, if you're watching with us online, there's a link in the chat right now that you can click on uh, either now or later on you can go back up and get it after the service and you can download a PDF of a, of a little booklet we're giving out at our in-person gatherings this morning to give you kind of a plan to read through these Gospels over the next four weeks. I, I challenge you to, to use this month of April to read the Gospels, maybe if you've never read them before or maybe if you have read them before, to read them uh, with a new light in mind as we look at Jesus together. Now this week we start 
with Matthew's gospel. Now, we've been referring to Matthew as the rabbi. And the reason we're doing that is because Matthew's whole purpose in writing about Jesus is to show us, is to show God's people, to show the Jews of his day, that Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promises found in the Old Testament. That, that Jesus is the one that shows us that when God says, I promise, he means it. And we can count on those promises as being certain and true. Now it starts in the very first chapter of Matthew. As, as Matthew kind of refers back to a story, you see, we know that our first parents in the Garden of Eden, in the very first book of the Bible in Genesis, they sinned. They, they did what was wrong in God's sight. And, and through that sin, they brought sin and death and brokenness into this world. But when that happened, God made a promise. And that promise was that he was going to send one of their descendants to fix that problem, to solve the sin problem, to, to take away their sin. And right away in the beginning of Matthew, we hear the story of how an angel appeared to Joseph and, and made a commitment to Joseph that, that he was going to have a son and, and he was going to name that son Jesus. And look at this last nine. He says, because he will save his people from their sins. Right away, Matthew is telling us the story about the angel, pointing out that Jesus is the one who's going to fulfill that promise God made way back in the book of Genesis, way back at the beginning of time. He would come to save us from their sins. He would be that descendant. But, but even more, Matthew goes on to say this. He says, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Matthew points out that God had not only promised a descendant, but the descendant, the son of God himself, who would come to rescue us from our sins. And Jesus is the fulfillment of that promise, Matthew says. He then goes on to show throughout his whole gospel how consistently, time after time, Jesus kept the promises about what the Messiah, this descendant, was going to be when he came. In Matthew 8, we read this, when evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to Jesus, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. And then Matthew says, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah, another promise. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. When Jesus healed people, it wasn't just to alleviate the suffering in their life. It was to keep God's promise. Another one of these comes in Matthew chapter 13, just a few chapters later. It says, Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. We looked at a parable last week from Matthew chapter 22, actually. And Matthew is saying that Jesus always taught with parables. And then Matthew tells us why. It's another promise. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. It's promised that when the Messiah comes, he will help us understand the deep things of life. And Jesus keeps that promise. One more, in, in Matthew chapter 21, it says, as they were approaching Jerusalem this Holy Week, this Palm Sunday that we celebrated last Sunday together, Jesus tells his disciples, instead of going and getting me a horse to ride triumphantly into the city, go find a donkey and I'll ride that. And then Matthew, again, points out the promise that Jesus was fulfilling. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey. God's promise was that he would send a leader, a king, but, but he would be a servant king, a leader who was humble and who would put the needs of his people first, and Jesus fulfills that promise. The whole point of Matthew's gospel is that Jesus shows that God keeps his promises. 
Now, I, I hope you will take the challenge and you'll read through the Gospel of Matthew this week. And I want you to watch because there are many more of these instances when Matthew points out Jesus as the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises. One scholar, by the way, estimates that in the four Gospels, Jesus is actually shown to be fulfilling 574 promises or prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. Even conservatively, most scholars say there are over 300 of those promises. Jesus was the ultimate promise keeper, showing that God keeps his promises. But as we end our Easter sermon and our Easter worship this Sunday, I, I want to point out two promises that Jesus has made to you and to me. Promises we can be confident that he will keep because God keeps his promises. Jesus makes these two amazing promises to us knowing that we really need to hear them. We really need these promises from him. Now, let me give you a little setup for the first of these promises. Jesus has been approached by the religious leaders of the day, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. These are two different groups of religious leaders, and, and they had different things that they believed about God and his promises. One of them believed that there was no resurrection of the dead. When you died, you were just dead. You just ceased to exist. But the other believed that there was a resurrection of the dead, that you would live beyond death. By the way, it was the Sadducees that didn't believe in the resurrection. And the way I remember that, maybe this will help you, is they didn't believe in the resurrection. So the Sadducees were sad, you see. I know, pretty bad, but it helps me remember. So these two groups, they came to Jesus and they kind of put Jesus in a spot here. Who, who was he going to agree with? How was he going to sort this out? Is there a resurrection or not? Now, Jesus handled the first kind of complicated part of their question, but then as to the resurrection, look at what Jesus said. He said, about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. In other words, Jesus said, God says, I'm Abraham's God, and I'm Isaac's God, and I'm Jacob's God. And, and if they weren't still alive, if they hadn't lived on beyond their deaths, he would have said, I was Abraham's God. I, I was Isaac's God. I was Jacob's God. Jesus is confessing for us. He's promising to us that our death is not the end for us. That our death is not final. That death is indeed simply the doorway to eternal life. And that is an amazing promise, which, by the way, Jesus demonstrated was true on that first Easter Sunday. When he rose from the dead, he proved that he was the first fruits, as Paul would later write, of those who would believe. In other words, because Jesus rose from the dead and because he promised us we would someday rise from the dead too, that our death was not the end, then we can trust that that is indeed true, that that is a promise that God will keep. Just as Jesus was raised from the dead, we will be raised from the dead too. And then right at the end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus made them one last promise. He said these words to his disciples when he was about to ascend into heaven. He was about to leave them. And he said to them, I'm going to be with you always to the end of the age. And he makes that same promise to you and to me. This side of heaven, he is always with us. This last week, I had a chance to be with one of my good friends, Pastor Mark Zender from King of Kings in Omaha. And, and he pointed something out to me uh, about this. This is, this is what he pointed out to me. He, he said, it's interesting because if Jesus had not ascended into heaven, if he had just stayed here on this earth, as the disciples were sent out all over the world to all these different places with the good news of the gospel, he could have only gone with one of them at a time. But because he ascended to heaven, because he is seated at the right hand of the Father, because he was sending them the gift of his spirit, he could be with all of them all the time. And that's his promise to you 
and to me. And one last look at the, the picture of my grandpa. By the way, I forgave him for breaking his promise and hiding my Easter basket in the dryer. But I have, to, I have to kind of watch it because when I talk about my grandpa, I say things like I said at the beginning of the message, like, you know, he was just one of my favorite people in the world. Jesus would say, don't say was, say is. Folks, the promise of Easter is that our death is not final. The death of those we love who have died in faith is not final. We know that we will see them again. That because Jesus rose from the dead, they too will rise from the dead with us. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. On this Easter Sunday, we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Would you bow your heads and pray together with me? Lord God, as we gather on this Easter Sunday, we pray, first of all, that you would heal our nation. To all those who mourn the loss of someone they love, touch them with your hope. For all those who still struggle with physical ailments, bring your healing hand into their lives. Lord, for our country, bring justice, bring peace, bring reconciliation. Knit us together as one people under your love and your grace. Lord, we pray for our families, that you would bless these times that we celebrate together, whether that is in person this Easter or whether it is apart. Lord, we look forward to that day when we will be able to be with all those we love with, without fear, without masks, without the need for distancing. Until then, assure our families of our love and comfort them with your presence. Lord, we pray for our church, especially in these next months as more and more people return to in-person worship and as our worship services come back to some semblance of normal. Help us to never again take for granted the joy it is to gather together and to sing and to, to laugh and to greet one another, to shake hands, to give hugs. Lord, help us be a church that is welcoming to all. So not just those who call Trinity their church home return to worship, but many others would come to gather together with us as we worship and praise you. And finally, Lord, we do pray that you would turn every heart to you. Last week, we heard that your invitation goes out to all. All are welcome at your heavenly banquet. Lord, Help us be people that in a winsome and clear way proclaim your love and your grace. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the point in our service where we take a few moments to remember the many blessings that God has given us. Everything we have, even our very lives, is a gift from him. In response to that love and grace in our lives, God encourages us to give back some of what he has given us for the work that we do together as God's people in all the places where we are found. We're thankful that our church family makes a difference in our communities and around the world through our mission partners. We're also thankful to you for what you give to help make that happen. There's a give link that has shown up in the chat. If you would like to give online, you can do that there. You can always send your donation into our church office and we thank you that you trust us enough to give us those gifts that together we can make a difference in God's kingdom. We also want to just let you know that as we have gathered together this Easter, Easter was a traditional time in the church when we were known to baptize people understanding that they were being welcomed into God's family. And if you're joining us today online and you have never been baptized or maybe you're not even sure if you were baptized when you were a child, I would love to talk with you about the gift of baptism and how that promise that God makes us through the waters of baptism, the promise of his love and grace and hope in our lives could be a promise he makes to you through your baptism as well. Again, there's a link that's come up in the chat. If you, if you click on that button there and give us some information, uh, we will contact you and see if there's a way that we can give you that gift of baptism as God works through water and word to make a very special, special promise to you. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began, and 
flesh was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet as my feet rose to dance. Death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace, so free, washes over me. You have made me new, now life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom faithfully bold. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. Oh yeah, that's where death was arrested and my life began. rejoiced as though heaven had lost but then Jesus arose with all freedom in hell that's when death was arrested and my life began that's when death was arrested and my life began Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all this Easter Sunday and this whole year. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Have a blessed Easter, everyone. <laughs>